Good morning, grace and peace be with you. Happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there, and happy Mother's Day to those of you who work in the art and craft and love of mothering other people. Thank you for your ministry. This is Youth Sunday, and I am, of course, the oldest preacher ever on Youth Sunday. I thought this would be a good day to recognize our graduating St. Paul seniors, John Busker, Aiden Rodriguez, Allie Ream, and Charlie Johnson. I'm sorry you have to graduate at a time like this, but I know that we all want to wish you many blessings and goodness in your life in the years ahead. I also, in solidarity, want to share a photo of another graduating senior. This is a graduate in the 1982 class of Roseburg, Oregon Senior High School. I would love to know whatever happened to that brown corduroy three-piece three suit. It's probably walking around somewhere, maybe in Wicker Park. Now, I was just unwittingly hip. It was the only 38 long suit in the shop. I think about my teen self, ready to graduate, ready to leave home, a bit afraid. I was full of so many questions, questions about myself, questions about God. I was a gay teen in a fundamentalist church. Of course, I had questions and doubts, but I had no one to talk over those questions with. I was not at home in the world because I was not home at home with myself. The disciples in this morning's scripture are sort of graduating seniors who are anxious about the future. This part of John is this speech of Jesus, and he's talking to his disciples while they're sitting during the Last Supper, eating together. He tells them that he's going to be leaving them soon. The disciples realize that they're no longer going to have the physical present of their teacher, their rabbi their friend to be with them and, and show them where to go. And so they're obviously anxious and they've got questions. Thomas and Philip both ask questions of Jesus. He, he clearly is not bothered by our questions. But Jesus doesn't give them any easy answers in response to their anxiety and fears. I saw a sign last week that someone protesting the stay at home order was carrying. The sign said, freedom over fear. Well, in response to the disciples' fear, Jesus doesn't give them from some first century version of American individualism. Instead, here's what he does. At the Last Supper, he gets up from the table, he takes off his outer garment, puts a towel around his waist, and he kneels in front of them one by one and washes their dirty feet. He performs the menial task of a servant. And then he says to them, love one another as I have loved you. After the attacks of 9-11, Meg Wheatley, who studies organizational behavior, wrote, in times of stress and uncertainty, we must give full attention to the quality of our relationships. Nothing else works. No new tools, no technical applications, no redesigned organizational chart. The solution is each other. If we can rely on one another, we can cope with almost anything. Without each other, we retreat into fear. The solution is each other. In response to their fear, Jesus points his disciples to each other and says to them, lean on each other, serve each other, rely on each other, love one another as I have loved you. Today we hear another response that he has to, to their fear. He says, believe in God and believe also in me. So what does it mean to believe in God? In English, we use that word believe in all sorts of ways. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in UFOs? Do you believe in ghosts? Well, the New Testament Greek word for believe, pistuo, it's the word we get epistemology from, is far more complex than our English word believe. I've talked about this before, but we actually need three English words to translate it. Believe, have faith, or simply to trust. As they face an uncertain future, Jesus is telling his disciples, trust me. Whatever is coming, you can trust me. Like love, trust is a relationship word. I'd never say, I believe in my partner, Joe. But I would say, I trust Joe. We trust the people that we believe are true and that we believe are trustworthy. What does it mean to trust in Jesus? 
Well, Jesus responds to Thomas's question, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When I was growing up, I often heard Christians use that verse as a sort of threat. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to heaven when you die. Jesus is the only way to God. Now, if you're using John 14, 6 as a threat, you're ripping it completely out of its context. Jesus isn't threatening Thomas with these words, believe in me or else. He's comforting Thomas in the midst of his fear. He's comforting with the assurance that even though Jesus will no longer be present with his disciples physically, he will be with them in spirit and he will always be with them, helping them and showing them the way to be close to God. What way does Jesus lead us, lead us on? What's, what sort of God does he point us toward? Well, for one thing, he said that God has this great big house and there are lots and lots of rooms in it. He says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to make more room. Jesus takes on the role of a homemaker, the domestic work that for centuries has been the, the role of mothers and women. Jesus takes on that homemaking role. The work of Jesus is to give us a home and that's the God we meet in him, a homemaker, a servant who washes our feet, who keeps us fed, who takes care of us when we're sick, who invites us to eat with him at his table. That's the God that the way, truth, and life of Jesus points to, a God who comes to serve, to love, to welcome us home. So who would Jesus be like today? He'd look like a custodian cleaning a bathroom. He'd look like the underpaid worker stocking grocery shelves, people preparing food, keeping us fed while I live in a privileged home. Jesus is bathing old bodies in nursing homes. He's working in hospitals and clinics, caring for the sick. When God came to us in Jesus, she lifted up every underpaid, underappreciated, marginalized, at-risk worker that we depend upon daily to feed us, clothe us, heal us, and protect us. The very people that our society is failing to protect. Bill McKibben wrote, the day will come when we can easily return to church, to the store, to the hairdresser. And for that, we'll be able to thank the scientists and brave doctors and nurses who did what they had to do during the emergency. But their courage will have been wasted if nothing deeper changes in how we treat one another and in how we treat the planet. Whatever the new normal will be, as Christians, our calling ahead is to make the new normal look more like neighborly love. I think about those first disciples about to graduate from high school Jesus. Like us, they faced an unknown and uncertain future. Unlike us, they did not have 2,000 years of doctrine and dogma and theology and Catholicism and the Reformation and Martin Luther and Protestantism and Boltmann and Bonhoeffer and Barth. All they had as they faced the future is the plan that Jesus left with them. Form a community of love. Love one another and trust me. Love one another and trust me. That's the same plan that Jesus gives to us today. In November of 1918, following the very worst month of the flu pandemic in Chicago, Pastor Rudolph John gave an address to the church on her 75th birthday. And I think it contains some of his most sustained reflection that we have about what the core value of St. Paul's is. There have been people, other Germans in the community who didn't attend our church calling us an Allerweltskirche. Now they meant it as a snide remark. It means all world church, just all over the place. But John said, I will claim all Allerwelt's Kirche. We are one. We are an all-world's church because we welcome everyone. Welcome and inclusivity is who we are at our core. It's amazing how little that core identity has changed after a hundred years. We've been called to be like Jesus, a church of homemakers, women, men, young and old, whose core understanding of God is love and welcome. Because God's house has many rooms, 
over the last 176 years, we just can't help ourselves. We keep making more rooms. Most of you know the story. More rooms for orphans, more rooms for the elderly, more rooms in 1968 for hippies, more rooms for the homeless, for LGBTQ folks, and most recently, more rooms for our siblings who worship with Lighthouse Church. More rooms for people to call home. We need to keep telling that story to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves in a time of fear like this, when our heart would tend to be troubled so that we don't forget who we are. To follow in the way, truth, and life of Jesus is to follow in the way of welcoming love. That's the light that God has given to us to shine and that will continue to shine on our path in the future. So, I've been thinking about this 18-year-old Jeff and what I would say to him, what I've learned after all these years since I graduated and what I wish that I had known then, what would you say to your 18-year-old self? Well, I'd start with, you're going to Oregon State University in the fall. When you get there, there's this liberal theologian teaching religious, religion classes. His name is Marcus Bork. You've never heard of him. Nobody talks about him at your fundamentalist church, and you won't hear about him for many, many more years. Take one of his classes. Now, you're probably not gonna agree with what he says, and you're never gonna agree with everything Borg says, but ask questions. Let your faith be challenged. A strong faith is a faith that can ask strong questions. Also, Find a home church that welcomes gay teens and that loves gay teens exactly as they are and that welcomes the questions that all teens have because if it doesn't, it's misunderstood the love of God. And above all, don't let go of Jesus. Keep hanging out with him. You can trust him. You really can. Because Jesus will always be more loving, more welcoming, and more surprising than anything you can ask or imagine. Amen.